Hello, Peter Katz. And hello to all of you listening, and welcome to another episode of In Time with my dear friend, Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe, and uh, I'm her co pilot, Peter Katz. So, Robin, I feel like I always start the shows. I feel like <laughs> next show, we're going to hear your voice first, okay? Done. It's a deal, but I love it. <laughs> We're going to have a Canadian standoff until you, <laughs> until you say hello to the people. Um, Robin, it's so nice to see you. It's always so nice to see you. And um, as, uh, as we say often, as we, as we begin our shows, just this reminder to people that you and I are creating this show in time. And so mm-hmm. uh, we're not always necessarily f- finding the most convenient moments. I'm in the middle of a move. Um, and, uh, but we do this because we love doing it and it fills our cup and because we want to share some of these great conversations that you and I just have all the time and, and, and see if they can kind of spill over and help fill other people's cups. Um, so Robin, what, uh, what's going on in your world right now? Where are you? It looks like you're at home. I know that. Um, but, uh, maybe wh- where are you in time? I appreciate it, Peter. And um, so I am home. And what's very special, um, speaking of moving, this is the longest I have actually been home since our family moved into our new space. I hadn't spent a full consecutive week at home since we moved in. So it is very much starting to feel like home. So I am at home and uh, we're, we're managing just those ebbs and flows that I think a lot of families and people in communities manage where uh, we're doing our best with the five people who are in our space um, to kind of find patterns and rhythms that work for everybody. Just being mindful that everybody has different needs and different levels of attention that they need at different times. We're stick handling a few ones that are little ones that are sick at home. So uh, we're doing we're doing our best, but it feels so good to wake up in the same spot for a consecutive week now. Hmm. I'm curious, like what are, what are some of the, uh, are there any house rules? Are there, or, uh, sort of house etiquette or like discussions or things that have been established, norms that have been established in your household that have, that have helped you, um, navigate coexistence with, with five humans? (laughs) <laughs> That's a really interesting question, Peter. Now, one of the things I love about, I love many things about my husband, but one in particular, Jeff always has this great way of reframing like transition or change as this opportunity to like level set and like create like, okay, fresh starts. And one of the things that we talked a lot about when we transitioned into the space is like, what fresh start do people need in which way? And like, how do we show up for one another to be able to do that? So it was almost as if like, you know, that's why we, I, you know, personally, I love the first of the month. Every time it's, I see a one on a calendar, it's like fresh start, right? Mondays, fresh starts. I love these kind of opportunities for life to give us these little redos and restarts. And so we talked a lot about like, okay, moving into this new space, what do like, what do people need? So everyone kind of was able to kind of like say like, Hey, now that, you know, we're going to be in the space, these are kind of the top three things that matter to me and that are important to me. So everybody kind of has a kind of a sense or even just like even clarity really, Peter, about like, what is it that one another needs to support each other in in a, in a new house and building new patterns and new routines and whatnot? And I can share with you, for me personally, one of the things that's so important is like, I really love, and I've talked about this before, like a morning routine. Like I really find like having a morning routine, but it's also like not wild in the sense of like, I have to you know wake up at four in the morning and it has to always be the same, but even just like having certain kind of things in place. So that way my morning routine, even though there's nimbleness to it, can be consistent. Um, and then people kind of rally around that to kind of help that happen and facilitate it. That's a big one for me at our house. Mm. I have two follow-up questions. Oh, I'm excited. So question number one is as far as this determining sort of what top three priorities yeah. were for, for each people moving it, like, was this like a formalized process? Did you sit down and, and have a, okay, it's family meeting time. Was, was there a, an Excel file that was shared <laughs> knowing Jeff? Like what, 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 how, how does this, how does that sort of unfold in a, in a living, breathing, moving family dynamic? 
Oh, I love that question. And you know my husband very well. So in Jeff's perfect world, this would have been probably in, uh, we would have brought in some type of project mapping software so we could like <laughs> capture and there could be this beautiful matrix that could show it. One of the things that we've learned parenting teenagers is like really short and sweet works really well. And sometimes we actually joke that like logic is the enemy um, when we're trying to deal with the psychology of teenagers. So we actually find like quick in your like just really quick team huddle okay these are the top three for jacks and then it's like disperse uh we actually find informal quick and just kind of to the point is actually what works really well with communicating with the kiddos because the reality is that you know so often i think as as parents especially we kind of turn everything into like you know lectures or a bit bigger than they need to be where it's just kind of like get to the point right so uh if we can get to the point quickly so it's pretty informal um but we kind of do these kind of team huddles and we always kind of take note when the Five of us are in a space together at the same time. So it'd be like, pause. Hey, we're all here right now in this moment. Hunter, mm-hmm. what are your top three things that you want to make sure that we're thinking about right now for you? Or how do we show up for you to support you in this change? And what's remarkable, Peter, is that even though, you know, these are children that like have grown up in the same household and their similarities, what their needs are, are so uniquely different. And mm-hmm. that's one of the things that I, I absolutely love is that it's so interesting how it's different and like what my support looks like to them is different, uh, despite the fact that they've had, you know, the same kind of exposure and upbringing. Mm. I love that. Um, I, I have another question that I want, wanted to follow up with, which was, which was about habit building. Yes. Um, but now I also want to, I want to share a little story. Uh, so yes. I'm, I'm torn here. Okay. Well, let's, let's cover habit building just for a yeah. second. Uh, just cause I've been, I've, I've had my nose, um, deep in James Clear's atomic mm-hmm. habits. And I think I've, I've already mentioned it before. I also, I just want to sort of, um, underline what you talked about, like the first of the month or these kind of threshold transition moments. I was just listening yeah. to, uh, Mel Robbins on the Rich Roll podcast, and she she was kind of talking about that too. That um, th- these opportunities for kind of these little mini resets or these little moments of like, okay, uh, with, you know, whether that's like your birthday or New Year's or whatever that might be, like, how do we create more of those moments where we kind of feel empowered to to kind of step into something new or or mm-hmm. or um, you know start a new habit or whatever that might be. But um, I'm just curious with your you, you mentioned kind of your morning routine being this, mm-hmm. this real priority. Um, I, I like, I I've had periods in my life where I've had like really good habits and then, and then there's other periods where I kind of lose, like, I'm, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I yeah. sort of fell off that good habit train. Um, so I'm curious to know, you know, one, just what are some of those, those morning habits that no matter yeah how much time you have they're they're non-negotiables and then like how have you uh, nurtured creating space and time for them especially in the context of of a busy household and and and, and just the, the busy you know full life that you you live mm-hmm. amazing question and I, I i think what really comes to mind when i think about habits is this idea that like and again to kind of appreciate that idea what you just shared about sometimes we like are in good patterns or good season where it feels almost like effortless and we get good flow and then all of a sudden we realize very slowly we've kind of gone off course or we've started to develop some other maybe even some maladaptive behaviors that are not necessarily setting us for success and I think that's so one of the things that I find helpful to think about is the fact that like motivation is very helpful for us to generate ideas right so we get this idea and we feel motivation and we're like, you know, that's why at the beginning of those transition thresholds, like the first of the month or New Year's or birthdays or anniversaries or whatever it is, we get this like almost like this surge of energy where it's like, oh my gosh, this is totally in. I got it this time. And then what's interesting is motivation is meant to give us that curiosity, that like that excitement to start, but discipline is what's going to carry you through because motivation is so fleeting. So then we start to look at, okay, so what are those disciplinary habits? And what's amazing about discipline and I love how um, uh, Jocko Williams writes about this in his Dichotomy of Leadership text, where he says, like, the discipline is what equals freedom. Because I think so often we think discipline is like punitive. It's like, you know, it's like mistaken with willpower, where discipline is like choosing this behavior and consistently choosing the behavior that is going to increase the likelihood of success.
success. So it's not meant to be punitive. It isn't willpower. And so thinking about, okay, so what habits actually will promote that discipline that I need to be able to meet my needs? And for me, I keep it very simple uh, because again, time and travel makes things a wee bit complex. So for me, it's something for my head, something for my heart and something for my body, right? So first thing in the morning before I ever open myself up to the world, especially before I ever, for example, look at a cell phone, it's like, what is, what are, what are those three things that I can do? Something for my head, something for my heart and something for my body. So for me, movement is really important. So first thing in the morning, I make sure I get up and I'm moving. Now when I'm at home, that's really easy because I have two gigantic dogs that remind me as soon as I open my eyes that Mm. it is time to adventure and, you know, rain or shine, minus 40 or not, uh, we're out moving about. So that makes it easier. But even when I'm not at home, I know the first thing that I need to do is move. And the way that I can get the discipline, Peter, to move even when I'm in hotels or traveling is I like go to find coffee, right? So it's this idea that there's a reinforcer at the end of it. I don't have coffee in my room. I physically get up, throw on even just a sweatshirt, track pants, and like literally go wherever I am in whatever city to move to go find coffee um, because I find getting outside and that movement helps. And then for my head, um, I find listening to podcasts, right? Like I listen to things Mm -hmm. in the morning that just kind of give me new ideas that just open myself up to like experiencing kind of new ways of seeing the world, increasing perspective. So I find having catalog podcasts already on my device actually helps. So you don't want to try to find a podcast to listen to in that moment. You want to set yourself Mm. up for sex. So you already have a podcast ready. And one of my little tricks that I do for myself, Peter, is I never really listen to a podcast from start to finish. I listen to like half of it and then I'll stop and then I'll listen to the final half the next morning and then 15 minutes of the next one. So I'm Mm. always in the middle of an episode because I find that helps with my kind of curiosity of wondering what was the next big idea. And the last one there is that idea about something for my heart. So whether that be gratitude, whether it be prayer, whether it be reflection. And the really cool thing about all those, Peter, you can do them all at the same time. It's not like I need to do five minutes of this and then five minutes. So as I'm going moving to find coffee, I'm listening to my podcast. As Mm. I have my coffee and I'm walking back, I'm doing those prayers, those gratitude exercises so we can do it all packaged together. Mm. I love that, Robin. Thank you for sharing. And you reminded me of one of my favorite uh, mindfulness practices is like the walking meditation. And, uh, and very, very simply, it's just as I'm walking, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I feeling? And just making note. It's just like, it's just like unattached note taking. Like, oh, you yeah. see that? I see this. I hear this. Notice this feeling. But it's like... What I kind of like about it, and I don't know if this is actually the design of it, but the feelings are just as like, in a way, uh, I, I don't know whether the word is inconsequential, or, but they're, they're just as not a big deal as, oh, there's a tree or there's something yeah. I'm hearing or oh, there's something I'm feeling. So it's sort of like it, it, it helps lessen the like intensity of, of feeling. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling this thing. It's like, oh, I'm just noticing the feeling. And, uh, I, I just love that, that walking meditation. And you know what? I haven't done it in a little while. So you've just reminded me and, uh, and I'm going to get, maybe I'll do one today. I love that, Peter. And one of the other gentle, thank you for sharing. One of the other things that I love with that walking meditation, especially if you do the same walk, like every day, because sometimes you go onto like autopilot. And one of the things I like to do to kind of challenge that when I'm doing those walking meditations as well is like noticing something new on an old path. So actually setting up the intention that I'm actively looking for something that I didn't see yesterday. And mm. I find even that exercise just kind of brings me even more into the present. Uh, because again, especially if you, let's say somebody walks the same route every day or, or you know, maybe they just kind of have this kind of routine to the point where they're maybe not feeling the benefits of it anymore, um, to give yourself those, you know, little invitations to see something new on an old path. Mm. I love that. I have, I have so many short stories I want to share, Robin. I'm I want to like hear bubbling. them all. I'm bubbling. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to share a little one and then I'm going to share a bigger one. I'm in. Um, so the little one that I want to share, which just, just came from our, our conversation right this moment, um, about mindfulness, um, is the idea around like when we know we have a big conversation to have, 
<laughs> and um, so yesterday, I you know I'm, I'm packing up and moving moving my place. And, uh, you know, I was sort of in the hustle and bustle of that. And, and my partner, uh, was, Tess was coming over and, and we, we, we had to have like a big conversation. There's like some big things happening in our life. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I knew that she was going to be coming. And I was like, as I was waiting for her to come and I'm packing, I could feel, um, that I was getting more and more kind of tense in my body and, and, um, I could feel sort of the stress and the anxiety. Um, and I think normally I would have just kind of kept that going until she arrived. Um, but instead I stopped and I, I, I made this really conscious choice and I actually changed all the lighting in the space. And I like you know, the counters were cluttered with stuff and I like, I, I cleaned the counters and I changed the lighting and this lighting that's behind me here, like creates this sort of like uh, kind of fiery glow, like this, you know, kind of simulates a, a fireplace. And I put on this like really soft piano music and I just sat on the couch and I did box breathing, uh, for like 10 minutes where you know, like breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four and, and, you know, hold for four. Um, and I'm so thankful that I did that because when she arrived, I was, I was in my heart and I was, I was able to be present and she walked in and she felt the space and felt like that, you know, there was a, there was a change for both of us. And so it was just such a reminder to me that when we do have to have these big conversations, like there's such little simple things. Like I'm always, I'm just always reminded, like we're just human beings, right? We're just like, like we're, we're, we're just like, we're, you know, overstimulated by too much light, too much sound, like, like by smells, like we're just these, these sentient beings and doing these simple little things. I'm, I feel like I'm going to cry for whatever reason, but just like, just breathing, changing the lighting, like, I feel like it just made such a difference in this relationship that I care about so much. And I I felt so thankful to have those little tools at my disposal and that awareness that I could choose to do that. Um, And I, I, I I think of you and I think about some of those tools and I think about some of our mutual friends like Mm -hmm. Dr. Greg Wells. And, and I also even just think about, my own background in, in theater and music and performance. And this idea that, um, it's the space, the physical space that we're in. I know you talk about this in your forces of recovery. Um, the physical space that we're in from the lighting to the sound, to even just the clutter, like can make such a big difference. So I just, Mm -hmm. just wanted to share that with you. Peter, I, I, I'm so appreciative that you shared that with all of us. And I just love that, that idea of like, you've picked up these little nuggets of wisdom or, you know, these little gems of insight along your path. And what I'm hearing and I'm feeling is that I'm so happy that in that moment, you like, you put it into action because I think so often we pick up these learnings or these lessons, but knowing when to use them is so important, if not even more important than the knowledge. So I appreciate that sharing of this idea, like, yeah, you, you knew this, you noticed it, which is amazing that you were able to do that with so much things going on, with so many things going on. And then you realize, okay, what tool matches what I need right now and our environments, we are so sensitive to our environment. So I love that you're able to just like create that, you know, that ease. And it's interesting in psychology and education, we often talk about that as like setting the table. So, and you know, and I imagine in theater and in music, you would have, you know, what it's setting the stage or however you do that. But this idea that like, before we go into that conversation or, you know, before even, for example, we go into maybe, you know, some time for self, um, self care or self reflection to actually just like, okay, set the, set the stage, like set the tone for the feelings Mm. that you want to feel. So here you were with all of this, like whether it be stress and anxiety, as you described, but you knew how you wanted to feel. And then what you actually did is did behaviors 
in that environment to create an environment where the feelings that you want could land, that they could grow, Mm -hmm. that they could actually take the front seat. So I love, love that you shared that. And again, so often when people are feeling stuck or feeling like in big feelings, that idea is like, what is it that you can do that will actually activate the feelings that you want to be feeling right now? So that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Mm, My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. It reminds me of, um, uh, again, one of my favorite podcasters, Rich Roll, he's, he always says mood follows action. And, yes. uh, and so I love the, uh, I love the idea of, I, I really like the idea of setting this, the table or, or in, I resonate with setting the stage, yeah. um, of like what creating the conditions, uh, for that, not, not necessarily the outcome that you want, because we, we can't really cre- create outcomes. We can't control how other people are going to react or, or any of those things. Um, but creating the feeling um, that we want to be uh, embodying, uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a powerful thought for me. I, I, like, I like that very, very much. Oh, Peter, well, you're welcome. And if I can expand that just slightly, please. Um, it's the idea so often, again, if we're feeling, you know, again, it's that clarity of what is it mm-hmm. that we actually want to be feeling. So I know I really love feeling like grounded and calm, but if I have 75 tabs open on my phone and mm-hmm. I have like a thousand different things happening and I'm highly distractible and there's things everywhere and dogs are barking and things are moving really quick. The, the feeling that I want to achieve that calmness, it's not congruent to that environment. So that it's that idea of like, okay, well, what can I do? What's my next right move in this mm. moment to create calm? And sometimes it's literally like actually physically turning off the phone, right? Like simply that act of turning off the phone. So it's not going to notify me. It's not going to ring. It's not going to do anything and actually put mm. it away is one right step I could do. That's going to create the likelihood that calm can grow and chaos can mm can shrink. Um, mm. So again, it's what's one behavior I can do. And then what's the second behavior. And then all of a sudden you can start to actually like change that environment in a way that makes the feeling that you want more accessible, but also more inviting for other people, right? Especially when you're sharing mm. spaces. So, you know, cleaning off that kitchen counter, changing the lights, putting on music, like that is creating an experience where other people are get drawn into it and they'll match mm. our moods, which is kind of cool how the human conditions work work that way. Mm, I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Robin, I'm making an executive decision to oh. save my other story oh. for the next episode. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to create an open loop, uh, it. which will, uh, so people can follow your advice to listen to half a podcast, maybe yeah. start a little bit of the next one. We're going to leave a little cliffhanger here. Um, I but I, I think the, the story that I want to, I want to share, I, I think you'll have thoughts that to expand upon it. And I think, uh, uh, it was a, a really special thing that I, I, okay. I want to share. So we'll leave the cliffhanger. And I always I feel like um, the questions that we have for each other get a little bit shortchanged and we rush mm-hmm. through them at the end. So I thought I would create some spaciousness for our, our questions this time around. And we'll see we'll see where they take us. Um, but uh, this idea of setting the table, I lit up because that has to do with the question that I have oh. prepared for you. So I was okay. like, oh, well, let's... Uh, Let's, uh, let's segue. I, you know, when you, when you see a perfect segue, you got to take it. So, take it. um, so here's my question for you, Robin. Um, what is, um, I, I actually wrote, wrote it down, but I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I, I don't know where I wrote it down. So I'll just say it out <laughs> loud. And, uh, it, those, I, I've been studying, you know, question design and my question design friends might criticize me for, uh, imperfection here, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so, um, I love this idea of setting the table and picture yourself sitting at that table. And I'd love to know, like, what is, of all the the meals uh, that you can have in your life and whether you've prepared the meal or the meal has been prepared for you, but what is the meal that you most associate with good feeling thoughts? Mm. And as I ask that question, if you so choose, uh, there's an invitation to also associate that particular meal with a memory or a story Mm. um, that, that comes up as I ask you the question. Oh, Peter, you ask very good questions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
This is so interesting because I feel at such different seasons and times in my life, it was so different. Mm. So I'm, I'm pulling on the thread of like consistently. So as, mm. as I've shared in my work, I've already kind of alluded to it in our conversations already this season. Um, I've obviously had some very dark seasons and so often I find that, especially as somebody who's experienced trauma, what happens is we kind of have like start and finishes where it's like, okay, that was the good part. That was the bad part. So one of the things that I'm really challenging myself to do is to like find the thread of like, where was Robin through all of that without it having to be good or bad season, but where are some of those consistent patterns that I carry with me now? And so the food that first came to my mind that is in that spirit of what was consistent, not just that was a good season in my life, that was a hard season in my life. Um, actually, it's pretty small in the sense that it's not a very uh, glamorous meal item, I would say. Um, but uh, it, we have this kind of thing around like mashed potatoes. And mm. it's funny because we would, you know, when I was growing up, we would have Sunday dinners and like mashed potatoes would be part of it. We had kind of a traditional kind of Sunday dinner type recipe. And I remember when I first went away to university, it was like the longest I had ever gone in my life without having mashed potatoes <laughs> and any version of mashed potatoes that were served in these cafeterias. They were like from <laughs> powdered boxes. Like, and I remember coming home and it would have been on, in Canada, it would have been our Canadian Thanksgiving in October when I first came home that first year. And like, seeing those mashed potatoes and like watching my mother make them like the whole stage of peeling and boiling and making them and then serving them. I remember thinking that, my gosh, mashed potatoes are such an expression of love. Like there's mm. a lot of work that goes into it. And it's so like, for me, it's like mashed potatoes and it kind of goes through, but the, the kind of piece that I would kind of bring that full circle with is we now kind of have this, you know, running joke with my teenagers that when mom slows down long enough or is home long enough to make mashed potatoes, that's actually like part of like, she loves us. So, mm. so not they, my kids know that I always love them, but it's like, you know, we kind of joke about the fact that like, oh, if we're making a meal that somehow has mashed potatoes in it, like this is like, this is mom connecting, this is mom bringing us all together. And so whenever we're like serving mashed potatoes, um, it's like this like expression or family, like all three of the teenagers are, it's like, oh my gosh, mom loves us. She made us mashed potatoes. And the really funny mashed potato story that's totally disconnected, but I think it just came to mind I'd share with you. I remember <laughs> one time my I was home from university and I had brought um, a new a new a new friend. We were like testing the waters with this new friend in this new relationship. And I brought this person home and I had been dating somebody previously for a very long time. And that person's name happened to be Michael the previous boyfriend. And I had a new friend at this family dinner. Again, it was very early stages, Peter. And my mom came around with this beautiful dish of mashed potatoes and looked at my new friend and said, Michael, would you like mashed potatoes? Which was the name of the previous boyfriend. And then she turned and literally like threw mashed potatoes at my father, who is, happens also to be Michael. And so her like a, attempt to like cover up a very honest name slip, completely justifiable. It was just, it was such an innocent mistake that she felt so terrible about. But the fact that my father ended up with like eight servings of mashed potatoes <laughs> um, in her attempt to try and like not make this person feel awkward. Um, it was really special. So Peter, that's a very long answer to say mashed potatoes are pretty freaking special in my life. Well, beautiful. Quick thinking on your mom's part. Um, yeah, very clever. Uh, I love I love that story. And um, maybe I, I, I say in the show notes, uh, maybe we'll have show notes. We haven't determined that yet. <laughs> but maybe you'll share your mashed potatoes yes. recipe in the show notes. And yes. um, and if it's not vegan, then I'll I'll uh, I'll look at it and veganize it for <laughs> our vegan listeners. All two of them. <laughs> I love it. And yes, in every language to that. And I think it speaks to my heritage of being from Prince Edward Island when my family immigrated. Um, my family immigrated. We landed in Prince Edward Island. So I think we're pretty passionate about our potatoes. So the recipe is pretty amazing. Okay. Well, I can't wait to, uh, to, to, to it, behold it <laughs> and, uh, for our listeners to be enjoying some mashed potatoes and listening to this podcast. So good, Peter. Now, Peter, that question you shared, yeah. I had my own question, but now I'm very curious about what 
is your experience with whether it be a food, a meal that brings those good feeling thoughts for you? Well, there's a million things I want to go to because I'm yeah. a passionate foodie. And, and uh, if, you, if you were to walk by, like look at my bedside table right now, you'd see a stack of cookbooks. I just love, like my favorite thing on earth is reading vegan cookbooks. Um, uh, especially I, I love sometimes going to the bookstore and like the ones that have the coffee shop in them and I'll get the coffee and I'll just have like a stack of books. So um, I could just go on and on and on and on about all the different, um, all the different meals and, and things that I just associate with it. But as, um, as <laughs> I don't know whether this is our protocol, but I'm just going to follow the, the, the first thing that, um, that kind of emerged for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, uh, this apple pie. And, um, it, it's funny cause I, you know, there's, there's like pie people or cake people and mm-hmm. I am historically a cake person. Uh, like I remember someone trying to describe the words too sweet to me. And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> like, 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 uh, so, um, however, my family, I'm one of four siblings and I'm the baby. And when we were kids every single year, we would get a giant bushel of apples and we had this, this futuristic device that you would attach to the side of the counter counter. and you'd, you know, plunk, plunk the apple on and it would like, it would peel it, it would slice it, it would core it all in one. I just thought that this was the greatest thing. Um, and we would, we had this kind of a assembly line and I was, I was, I was in charge of, of the apple peeling most of the time. The crust was a, was more sophisticated thing that my mom and my older brother, as he got older, was able to, to get in on. Um, and then, so there was the, the, the chopping of the apples. Um, then there was the uh, coating them in the, the brown sugar and all the cinnamon and all the, the different uh, seasonings. And then there was uh, putting it all together and then putting the little dots of butter and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and we would literally make, uh, uh, over 30 pies some, some years uh, and we just had be cooking pies all day. And then, and then like only the most special people in our lives would be gifted a pie. Or if we had special company over, we'd pull out one of the apple pies. Um, and my mom, and uh, now my stepdad, uh, to this day, they, they, they make these pies every year and, um, and every now and then it's been, it's been a while, but, uh, every now and then I've gone home to, to be part of the, the pie baking process and, uh, and they're now veganized. I'm pleased to say, cause uh, <laughs> my mom has gone vegan. Um, and, um, uh, and they're just as good. Uh, and, um, I don't know, there's something about that particular pie, that particular recipe. Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciated what you said about, um, not sort of differentiating like the good times or the bad times and like this common through line because Mm -hmm. this is emotional for me too. Like, um, like my family, uh, when I was 12, my parents divorced and, and this sort of, uh, utopia, living on a crescent in the suburbs and playing with the neighborhood kids and this sort of, we were the, the cat's family and in like this big family of six load into the minivan and making apple pies like that all just kind of ended real fast. Um, and by the time I was 16, I was living on my own in an apartment and just like really dramatic shift in a short period of time. Um, but the apple pies, uh, have been there, the whole time. And, um, that's a nice feeling to, to think about. And, and, um, and it's, a it's, uh, there's just something about that particular flavor and the, the kind of the sanctity and the rareness of when we find, you know, when we dip into one of those pies, it's like, it's only under the most special circumstances, um, that I, uh, appreciate and, and, gives me a really good feeling in my heart. Oh, wow. Peter, thank you for sharing that story on so many levels, on so many levels. You know, I think people Mm. can really relate to this, this idea that, you know, we have these 
lived experiences that all of a sudden, you know, just shake us to our core. And Mm. yet there are some things that are able to persist through that, that can still hold positive, good feeling thoughts. And I'm glad for you that you have apple pies in your life. And I'm (laughs) glad in my life, I'll have mashed potatoes always. So, oh, I want to know how you veganize an apple pie, Peter. How do you do that? (laughs) <laughs> you just you just take the butter and use uh, a, a vegan butter. I, I mean, even like the Crisco or those kind of things are actually plant based. So um, <laughs> so um, so there's it's uh, yeah. You just replace the the butter. I, I don't I don't think we have any eggs in that in that in that crust. It's just a classic uh, you know water, salt, flour, um, butter crust. So it's amazing, um, Peter. Well, I see that we're um, we're at the little bit past our thirty minute um, target. Um, I wanted to just say one final thing to you, Robin. Um, I I was I was overcome with this feeling as as you and I have been talking that um, you know we have there's people that you meet and and you, you're like, Oh, I love that person. And, and, you know, you see them every now and then and you're like, Oh, it's like just awesome spending time with them. And, um, but sometimes like you don't, you don't get to sort of drop more deeply just because even, even though you know that like you could be the best of friends, but it's just like life happens and it's just, um, and I just felt this, wave of gratitude. Cause like from the moment I met you, I was like, Oh, I just love Robin. Like just such good energy. Um, but I feel so thankful that we're doing these conversations and we're just deepening our relationship and deepening our connection. And, um, and that really feels so special and I'm so thankful for it. And, um, and I guess I always want to make sure that we're thinking of our listeners out there as, as we connect and, and like you and I are finding half an hour every now and then, but I just feel like it's so special. And so maybe if there's the the person out there, you are listeners who you're like, you know what? I, I love that person. Like, can you find 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes, um, to just connect and, and ask each other a great question and drop a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just overwhelmed with how thankful I am that you and I get to do this. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so mutual. And I love in the whole spirit of this, Peter, is that I know we don't ever get to like make time and it's the only resource that we can't create more of. But what this has reminded me is that these small windows of time just can touch hearts in a really deep and meaningful way. So we're not making time, but just this idea of how we're showing up for one another in time, it, uh, this means the world to me too. So thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to doing this again soon with my big story reveal. And uh, <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for listening and we'll thank see you. you next time. Bye.